combustion engine, you know. You go to <coughs> mechanic school, you got to label all the parts. You know, you air filter, oil filter, spark plug, the two different chambers, the radiator, and how the system is, how the cooling system interacts, how the oil system works, and so on and so forth. So now you not only have all the parts, but you have how all the parts work together. So in this case, the ego way of breaking it down and looking at all the parts is looking at the motivation of your daughter, for instance. Looking at all those things that are still out there. Out there. You know, looking, what, looking what's she it, doing, it. why is she doing it, da 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 da, da. Yeah. That's the ego's way of... Financially, with bringing the car back and the money involved with that, the financial kind of analysis, we mm -hmm. could call it, and then there's the safety analysis of the tacked on with that about driving a little three-cylinder team across the country. Be like listing the pros and the cons. Yeah, which is what we've been trained in yeah. in many cases, mm -hmm. and have gotten very good and at. That's our problem. Yeah. And have, yeah. yeah, have thought that was mature, that was responsible, and that it would it worked. Yeah. yeah. That it, and even good. solicit advice. You know, if there seems to be lots of advice, oh, like yeah. your daughter <laughs> is crazy. <laughs> <laughs>
because you know, you might say, oh, mom, forget, forget it. No problem. I'm going to be fine. And don't worry about me and this and that. She doesn't have a belief in fear for her no. safety. No, probably. No, yeah. she does. Not. So again, that would just be kind of a symbol of here comes the Holy Spirit seemingly yeah. <laughs> through the other to say, it's okay. Yeah. I'm all right. I'm safe, you know. And that would be a symbolic kind of representation. Yeah. Even if the car does break down, I'm safe. Yeah. And, and you know, that's how she feels, you know. It doesn't matter, you know. Mm-hmm. And when you really think about it, it does for yourself. Really matter, yeah. You can say, "Yeah, she is always safe mm-hmm. because she is not that body. Right? That body might be harmed, but she is always safe, and and she's not fearful mm-hmm. either. Which mm-hmm. you know, that which is a key element. Yeah. Because yeah. if there was if there was fear in her mind, then that would be something to to take a look at too. Uh-huh. You know, to try to work with, but. No, she she knows the car will make it. It's, it's perfect, you know. Yeah. And yeah. so I just need to. Yes, for me it's been a journey of just of just listening to the guidance. In other words, a lot of times as I've traveled around the country and given these talks, I'll be driving along and and it, it'll just come real clear. Pick up that anchor. Well, there's some more <laughs> conditioning, you know. The voice says, pick up, stop, and pick up the hitchhiker. It's being guided from within. You, the, the safety, the trust, the, the whatever that seems to be tied into all the good intentions of, well, you've got to be careful with strangers and this and that. And I've been in inner city areas. If I'm breaking off in my mind, who who are the safe ones and who are the unsafe ones based on physical appearance? I look at that one, real raggedy, long hair. <laughs> Look at that leather jacket and this and that. Well, goodbye. <laughs> you know, again, I'm not. Li- I need to be tuned in and listening because the Holy Spirit is the one who's orchestrating this plan of atonement, and He knows who the encounters are we're to have, and He knows who can receive certain lessons and and who's in a position to to give them. I and mean, He's got like a bird's eye view of the whole thing. And when you, if you try to do it from a personal standpoint. You know, like a personal plan of atonement, then you get into just what you do is you keep falling back on past experience. And again, the mind thinks it knows. Well, I know I'm not going to pick up that person because look at the way it's dressed. Or it's 10 o'clock at night and it's dark. I'll I pick. I just read a story about somebody who got yeah, killed. Yeah, well, I saw on the news when yeah. somebody picked somebody up and was killed and that. And again, it's not a rule of thumb. It's like I don't go around saying I pick up. Every hitchhiker I see, you know, it's not a form thing, but it it gets back to it's it's a real clear guidance at times. Like our he'll turn around, our eyes meet, and it's like something tries to stop. And I've had wonderful encounters. I mean, I've I've had encounters with I've had a hitchhiker with I was with Beverly one time where we traveled from Georgia through Kentucky. You know, I guess through three states with. Uh, someone I picked up. And when I picked him up, he had a knife. Um, he had a grizzly beard. He had a leather, had a leather jacket. jacket. <laughs> he was suicidal. He was in deep despair and um, almost despondent you know, when we picked him up in Georgia. And again, it was like I was definitely guided to pick him up. And as he came in the car, it was that thing of just kept asking. I kept saying, okay, Holy Spirit, now now what? <laughs> you know, what do I say? What do I do? You know, here. And the first thing I got, you know, when Randy, his name was Randy, when he was in the car, was, um, was listen. He's, he's going to talk. He's got something to say. Listen to it. So I listened, and, and little by little, he, he opened up, and he started talking about, um, his life. He lived in Cleveland. He was homeless. He had been homeless was, since he was 14. <laughs> he was 34 years old. He'd been homeless since he was 14 years old. Less than 20, 20 years. He had a girlfriend recently. He had moved in with her. She was pregnant with his child. 
she had just recently been hit by a car. Her and the child, the child she was pregnant with were killed. He had some brothers and sisters. They had committed suicide. He was among a whole family of brothers and sisters who had committed suicide. And he basically got to the bottom line was, I don't know that it's worth going on and living anymore. He says, I think I've about had it with this world. I'm raised, you know. And did you say that he had been beaten up and... Well, that was the next yeah. part. He had, he'd been trying to hitchhike, he said, from, from Cleveland to Florida. For the winter. For the winter, just to get off the street so they could be homeless in a warmer you know, climate. <laughs> Tampa Bay or, or St. Pete, I think, was where he said he was trying to go to. <coughs> so he could be homeless on the streets of, in Florida rather than in Cleveland. And he really had no family. Um, he, he was just in despair. And, and he, he didn't make it to Florida. He got down as far as Atlanta. And he said two fellows had mugged him in Atlanta on the street and had beaten him. And he, in total despair, he just was kind of dazed and disoriented. He just thought, oh, I'm just, I'm going back. I'm just going to start hitchhiking north. And, and so he had just hopped on, the, got on the highway, or was right there when I picked him up in Georgia after he'd just been mugged in Atlanta. So this is kind of the background. This is, this is the theming situation. But again, you know, for me it was just like I was to pick him up and I was to just keep asking. And so he told me his story. So do you want me to tell the rest of the story while you go pick Mary up? <laughs> well, you can go ahead. We have three minutes. You can tell the rest of the story. Uh, well, you can talk for three more minutes. I well, generally, I kept <laughs> asking. And he was also, he was kind of like, um, I got to smoke. I got to smoke, man. I just got to get it. We, we've just been in the car for a while. And he said, I got to get off. I got to have a smoke and everything. And he found out we didn't smoke and didn't have cigarettes in the car. Yeah. And so, um, he said, i got to get out of here. I think maybe you should just pull over and let me out. And I, I asked the Holy Spirit I, again. I said, you know, what, what should I say? What should I do? And the Holy Spirit said, he's going to be with you for a while. Don't worry about that. And so I said, well, we don't smoke, but in a while we're going to be stopping off to go to the restroom, and you're welcome to, you know, stop with us and take a smoke then, and, you know, we're going to get some food and stuff. And, and so he, he said, okay. He said, okay. And... He, we started to talk, and then little by little I started to talk and open up and share a little more of my life and what I was doing and traveling around and, and trusting and being guided from place to place, a very loose life with not a lot of structure and everything, and, and uh, just sharing ideas that were inspiring and everything. And, and he said, are you too religious? He said, well, kind of, you know, it depends on what you mean by religious, because we certainly weren't, in any stretch of the imagination, formal ministers with, you know, being pastors or anything like that, but we were ministers of God, in the sense that I didn't even go into that, so he, he listened more and more, and then I told him some experiences we had had in Florida, where we had gone out for a walk and our whole car was gone when we got back in Miami and the and everything we had everything with we had taken with us was taken and so on and so forth and how we just trusted and were guided moment by moment and every the car came the police recovered the car, we got this, we had all these holy encounters and I just shared the whole thing and he said he said at first he said, You know, you're as bad off as I am. You can't trust people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he was he was interpreting the experience from the ego perspective perspective, even though we, for us it was a great thing of how you're taken care of and everything works out. But he said, uh, and you can't leave money in the car, and he was, you know, giving some advice, but he was opening up, you know, now he wasn't quite so despondent, he was like, you know, helping us out. He, he yeah. thought he was giving advice, but he was starting to talk. So we, it went on, we were up in Tennessee, and we started sharing more and more experiences, and he started to get real interested, and then we stopped for, to get some groceries, and he went to the bathroom and had a smoke, and, and he really perked up. I mean, he was listening very closely to the ideas and, and that we were sharing, and uh, he started to get more and more fed, and he, he said, you know, I didn't always have this mean streak in me. I didn't always, I wasn't always so hard. He said, I used to, to really relate to kids and, and take them out and do things with them, and now the soft side, you know, that was under all the crust started to come up. And, you, and his voice was lifting up 